morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. We know there are a lot of things competing for your attention, so we really appreciate you being here today. Um, uh, I hope you were here yesterday, but in case you weren't, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our speaker, Mary Lou Zeman. Um, uh, Mary Lou Zeman went to the University of Oxford, and she got her PhD from Berkeley. And she is now an R. Wells Johnson Professor of Mathematics at Bowdoin College. Um, Yesterday was mentioned by Tensia, who did the introduction, and, and by um, Mary Lou Zeman, um, that uh, Bowdoin's mission is very much to, uh, or to instill in students a willingness to serve the common good. I actually pulled the quote. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I agree with Tensia when I say that uh, Mary Lou uh, embodies this, uh, this ideal, this value. Um, I've also heard that she is a, a true connector, that she really finds people for all these collaborations. You see a lot of pictures of people that she works with, and she's, she's one of these people that can find folks and, and get them in touch with each other and develop uh, new connections, new relationships, new collaborations. Um, yesterday we heard about uh, flow kick systems and their applications to many different things uh, like savanna fires, fish harvesting, and immunology. Um, and I think today we're in for a more abstract treat as uh, it was uh, foreshadowed yesterday, um, and we're going to listen uh, to Mary Lou about uh, reactivity in 2D linear systems. So let's welcome Mary Lou Zeman. Thank you very much. I think we probably have to bring this back to life. There we go. So thank you for that very nice introduction. And it's a pleasure for me to be here again. And um, yes, there's a lot competing for your attention. So thanks for coming back. Um, I'd like to spend just a few moments reminding us, um, in case you weren't here yesterday, just reminding you about a very quick review of what we talked about yesterday um, and how that led to the rather different type of talk and material today. So yesterday I was just talking about resilience and um, in thinking about resilience as a math modeler, passing the different disturbance patterns um, and the state of the system or the properties of the system that we might want to preserve in a resilient, for a resilient system. We focus particularly on regular repeated disturbance patterns, which is what led to our idea of flow kick systems. Um, a flow kick system, we were allowing a differential equation to flow for a certain time tau, and then we kicked it, and then we iterated that. So here's an example in two dimensions. And so when we iterated that idea, we, looked, we saw that we could converge to a flow kick equilibrium somewhere else in space, not, not at the equilibrium of the original underlying ODE, which is down here, but just somewhere in space. And we talked about how it could be anywhere in space. Um, that brought us to focus on the balance between the transient dynamics in space and the size of the kick and the direction of the kick that we were giving. In a different way of thinking about it, that's like a generalization of this idea of the steepness of a potential function. So a lot of people think about um, dynamics through potential functions, and the steepness of the potential function can be thinking about the strength of the attraction and how that's balanced with potential kicks away from the attractor. So it's generalizing that idea. We looked briefly at an example like this. This underlying system was a two-dimensional competitive lock of Altera system with one type of um, kick size and flow time. The flow kick dynamics, which are here in color, sort of echo the um, alternative stable states on the axes. They're no longer on the axes, but they're towards the axes and a saddle in the middle. So dominance, more or less dominance of one species or the other. But when we chose a different, slightly bigger kick, then we got completely different dynamics of um, stable coexistence of these species. So we saw that um, these flow kick systems can lead to bifurcations and the question of stability of an equilibrium and, of course, stability of all the other things you could have and periodic orbits, all those things come into play, but for the moment we were focusing on equilibria. 
And how would we determine the stability of a flochic equilibrium? So we thought about that if we've got a flochic equilibrium, and here's an example, x1 is an equilibrium where we flow for time tau and kick back to exactly x1. That makes it a flochic equilibrium for this choice of tau and k. Um, to find the stability of that, we need to find the, um, we need to linearize all the way down, the dynamics all the way down this little piece of trajectory then kick back, but we need to find out what's the accumulated stability as we move down that little piece of trajectory. And that uses the variational equation. And so remember the variational equation is what happens when, as you move down the piece of trajectory, you're asking what happens to your neighbors. You're, here you are moving down the important trajectory, and here are your neighbors. They may be moving towards you or away from you or towards you or away from you. What's the cumulative effect? Did they move towards you or away for you? from you. That's what the variational equation captures. And so we had this question, if we have attraction at every frozen moment in time, if we have attraction so that we know that in the long run our neighbors would move towards us at each moment in time, if as we move down our little piece of trajectory there's always attraction, does that mean that the cumulative effect is attracting? And the well-known but counterintuitive answer is no. And so that's what's prompted um, this work on reactivity, because the reason the answer is no is that a system can be reactive. And so here's a reactive system. It's attracting. These bullseye rings are showing you the distance from the origin. The, if you take an initial condition here, for example, you see that you are eventually attracted to the origin. For all initial conditions, you eventually come to the origin. These parts are moving in towards the origin, in, in through the bullseye rings, but here you're moving out through the bullseye rings. And so moving out means your radius is increasing. So, you, um, so that's the reactive region, this red region, where things are moving away from the origin before they move towards. And so this question, why this question is, reactivity is relevant for this question about um, the variational equation is, it could be that as you're moving down your variational trajectory, that um, you just happen to be capturing all the way along, you're capturing the reactive part of, um, of the system, of the fr time frozen attractors may all have reactive parts and you're capturing always the reactive parts, so you're actually moving away. The cumulative effect is to, over the time tau is to move away from, from the uh, central trajectory. So understanding reactivity is really helpful for understanding what's going on in those situations and trying to find conditions under which that might not happen. So what is reactivity? It was introduced in this beautiful paper by Neubert and Coswell. Um, and it means, as we've said, the maximum instantaneous rate of radial amplification. So here in this um, we're letting R measure the distance from the origin, then these red regions, if you start in a red region, you're moving away from the origin. So you could calculate it as you take um, the, your time derivative of your distance from the origin and take the maximum over all possible initial conditions. And in this example, we're seeing that sometimes that's positive, so the maximum is positive. So, and when the maximum is positive, we say the system is reactive, and that's because it's reacting to a disturbance it might have away from its attractor. Since we're looking at linear systems, by linearity, we don't have to look at all initial conditions. We can restrict attention to the unit circle. So um, then R is 1. And so literally, the reactivity is the maximum radial derivative around the unit circle, dr by dt around the unit circle. So that's what we're going to focus on. And just uh, before we go there, what's our, re our intuition for reactivity? It's, it's, it's all connected with stiff systems and um, different, it has different names and different applications. But one of our sets of intuition is that if we fix the eigenvalues, so here the eigenvalues are negative one and negative three always, then we can think about the eigenvectors, which are mapped in blue. As the eigenvectors get closer and closer together, then that's putting more kind of 
twist is almost spiraling, so it's giving more rotation impact to the, to the system. And so as the eigenvectors get closer together, the system gets more stiff and the reactivity increases. That's one of our kind of fuzzy pieces of intuition. As eigenvectors converge, reactivity increases. Alternatively, we could fix the eigenvectors, um, have them non-perpendicular. As long as they're not perpendicular, fix the eigenvectors. Then as the eigenvalues diverge, the reactivity increases. So those are our fuzzy bits of intuition about it. Um, but let's go back to actually calculating it, getting more precise. So to do that, since we're thinking about what we care about is the radial distance from the origin, let's decompose our vector field into radial and tangential components. So for any point, here's a point X on the unit circle, let's say, um, and here's AX, the vector field. It's a linear, remember it's a linear vector field, so it's a matrix times X. Um, and here we just decomposed it into radial and tangential components and it's some amount of x, um, this original x, plus some amount of the perpendicular vector to x, x perp. And the linearity of the vector field means that it doesn't matter how far out we are, it, the decomposition only depends on theta. And so we can write um, ax as r, this radial um, function of theta only times x, and a tangential function of theta only times x perp. And so then the question becomes, okay, what are these functions? The radial function and the tangential function. And the lemma is uh, so sweet and so neat, those radial functions are sinusoidal functions. Um, and so I've written them in a particular form. You can, lots of different ways you can write these sinusoidal functions. But we've written in them in the form here where um, the we have the midlines, we've isolated the midlines, and they are given by these easy functions of the original matrix. Um, they have the same amplitude, and we've, we've translated them so that um, we're naming theta rho is this maximum of R of theta. And R of theta is, on the unit circle, is exactly the thing we're looking for. It's the rate of change of the radius with respect to time. It's dr by dt. So let's look at, let's, um, look at some properties of this. Uh, as we said, they're sinusoidal uh, with period pi. It's not surprising it's period pi. The same thing's happening on the opposite side of the circle for this linear system. They have the same amplitude um, and they're pi over four out of phase. Because it's like we've taken a regular vanilla sine and cosine and just compress them instead of being pi over two out of phase, they're pi, out of, pi over four out of phase. Um, there's the, the midline of the tangential component, is um, mt, it's just this easy function of the parameters. There's the midline of the radial component, which is half the trace of the determinant, of the, sorry, of the original matrix. And here's the reactivity. It's the maximum of dr by dt. So the reactivity that we're calling rho one is just the maximum of this radial, of this, um, radial component of velocity. And the reactive region, we're calling this the reactive region, all the places where dr by dt is positive. So this is the region on which you're moving away from the origin before you come towards the origin. Um, and just to, we can, name a few more things, the, the maximum, here we said the maximum of the radial velocity is rho one, we'll call the minimum rho two, and we could also call that the attenuation, and we'll call the maximum of the tangential velocity tau one, and we'll call the minimum tau two. So we've got some notation. So okay, question, what, does the, um, what do these radial and tangential components of velocity tell us about the dynamics? So here's an example. I've got the dynamics and the functions next to each other. So let's focus first on the tangential dynamics. So notice this is just a one-dimensional differential equation. d theta by dt is a function of theta. 
And so we can do one-dimensional dynamics on the theta axis. And we see, okay, we have these fixed points of the system. Um, and a fixed point of tangential velocity, what's that? We're saying there's no, change in t there's no change in the tangential direction, which means the tangential, you have only radial motion, you have no tangential motion. If you have only radial motion, you're moving along an eigenvector. So the fixed points of the, the zeros of the tangential component of velocity are the eigenvectors of the dynamics. And we can say more, this one is attracting if we think about this fixed point and as a one-dimensional dynamical system, then if we're just below it, the tangential velocity is positive, moving us towards this point and so on. So this eigenvector is attracting, um, this eigenvector is repelling, which means that this one is actually the unstable eigenvector because the stable eigenvector is pushing us towards the unstable eigenvector. So again, we're seeing the dynamics um, we can pick out a lot of the dynamics of the system from this tangential velocity. And then what does the radial velocity give us? Here we were, here's an eigenvector. The radial velocity at the eigenvector is saying what speed are you moving in or out of the origin? So it's your eigenvalue. So at an eigenvector, if you go up and look to the radial velocity, you find the eigenvalues. Um, so that's telling us all kinds of lovely information that we enjoy for dynamics. So a question for you. What dynamics are these? So first question, are the eigenvalues real or complex? And the second question is, is the equilibrium, this is a linear differential equation, there's an equilibrium at the origin, is the equilibrium um, attracting or repelling or a saddle? So are the eigenvalues real or complex? The eigenvalues, remember, are at the zeros of the tangential velocities, and it has some zeros. So the eigenvalues are real. So yes, the eigenvalues are real. And then what are the eigenvalues? Are they positive or negative? At each zero, if we track down, we'll see that all the eigenvalues are negative. And so the system is attracting. Here, let's take two, here's an eigenvector and it's negative eigenvalue, eigenvector and negative eigenvalue. What about these? What dynamics are these? In this system, the tangential velocity is zero and the radial velocity is constant. So if the tangential velocity is zero everywhere, there's no rotational motion at all, there's just straight radial motion and the radial motion is actually negative, so it's radial in, so the dynamics are a star attractor. I'm not putting arrows on these, um, so we'll have to look at the radial uh, dynamics to see whether it's attracting or repelling, but usually they're attractors. Um, okay, if we make the eigenvalues asymmetric, then we get the nice sinusoidal shapes. But so long as the, um, so long as the midline is at zero, then that means these zeros are going to be, the zeros of the tangential velocity are going to be pi over two apart, which means we have orthogonal eigenvectors. So it's another way of saying that um, a symmetric matrix has orthogonal eigenvectors. And if we make it symmetric but without zeros on the off diagonals, then it still has orthogonal eigenvectors, they're just rotating around. If we start with this guy again, but now let's shift the tangential velocity up. So remember the zeros of the tangential velocity are where we have eigenvectors. So if we shift the tangential velocity up, the eigenvectors are coming together. Um, and here the eigenvectors have coalesced and now there are no real eigenvectors because there are no real eigenvalues. And so once the tangential velocity is entirely to one side of um, the theta axis, we know we've got complex eigenvalues and a spiraling equilibrium. And this, uh, the impact of shifting the tangential velocity up, of shifting the midline of the tangential velocity up, 
is to add counterclockwise angular velocity. This is something we'll come back to. We're, at, we're just adding more and more angular velocity all the time because we're adding um, counterclockwise rotation. Now here's the, here are the cases that um, we had our intuition for with reactivity. Um, as the eigenvectors are converging, remember the blue represent the eigenvectors, as the eigenvectors get closer together, here's what's happening with the radial and tangential components of velocity. And so we see that the reactivity, there's no reactivity in this system here, there's a little reactive region, bigger reactive region, the reactivity is getting higher and so on. What about these? What are these dynamics? So this time, the reactivity is zero and the tangential velocity is constant. Sorry, I said reactivity. That's true, the reactivity is zero. The entire radial velocity is zero everywhere. So there's no radial velocity. There's no in or out. There's just tangential velocity, just rotational. So that must mean that we've got um, circular periodic orbits. So we have a center, a circular center. And now if we make this asymmetric, we get back the sinusoidal shapes, um, but we still have a center. And so as long as the, as long as the midline of the, of the radial velocity is zero, then we have a center, the reactive regions have size pi over two, and we see them here, they're just quadrants. Um, if, we move the, if we move the midline of the radial component down, that means we're adding contraction to the system, and so what was elliptically a center, we're now contracting it, and so it becomes an elliptic spiral in. And the reactive region shrinks accordingly, and if we move the um, radial component down far enough, if we move r of theta down far enough, then we lose all reactivity because we're, r of theta is entirely below the axis. So we're just spiraling in. So that's a lot of intuition for how we can read um, what the radial and tangential components of velocity give us. Um, and it's, you might be beginning to feel this duality between the eigenvectors and what we'll call the orthovectors. So here, here again is a reminder of the eigenvectors. They tell the, um, they're where the tangential velocity is zero and the eigenvalues tell us the radial growth along, or in this case, contraction along the eigenvectors. And the eigenvalues are given by R of the eigenvector angles. And the midline of the radial velocity exactly bisects the eigenvalues. That's the quadratic equation in action. We'll call the ortho vectors the place where the radial velocity is zero. So those are the boundaries of the reacted region. Um, and then the ortho values, the values of the tangential velocity at the ortho vectors, tell us how fast we're traveling through, into and out of the reactive region. And so, the, and the midline of the tangential velocity bisects the ortho values. And so you see this duality, these pictures look so similar. And I don't have a slide for it, but in fact, you can calculate the ortho values and ortho vectors as eigenvalues and eigenvectors of um, of a rotated matrix. Take your original matrix A, rotate it by 90 degrees, and then the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that give you the ortho values and ortho vectors of the original A. So there's an easy way to calculate them. So now, is, is this viewpoint useful? It's, it's very pretty, I find it so pretty, but is it useful? So what happens when we diagonalize? Um, and this is standard, right? When we want to understand the matrix, we diagonalize it. And when we diagonalize it, we keep track of the eigenvalues and the long run behavior, but we lose track of the angle between the eigenvectors and therefore we lose track of the transient re reactivity. By contrast, what happens if we conjugate by rotation? 
then of course if we just rotate a system we're going to keep track of the eigenvalues and long-run behavior and we'll also keep track of the eigenvector separation and the transient reactivity. So if we're going to rotate, there are, how much should we rotate? What are some useful amounts to conjugate by? So we could rotate to focus on the eigenvectors. This is a classic way to rotate to put one of the eigenvectors on the x-axis. Or we could rotate to symmetrize the eigenvectors, so they're symmetric about the axes. Symmetric about the y-axis, also symmetric about the x-axis. That's classic. But if we care about reactivity, we could rotate like this. We could rotate to put the beginning of the reactive region on the x-axis. Or we could rotate to put the reactive region symmetrically around the axes so that the actual reactivity, the maximum, reactivi the maximum amount of radial amplification is along the x-axis. So we have choices about how much to re rotate. And um, from the point of view of these radial and tangential components of velocity, Conjugation by rotation just translates them horizontally along the theta axis. It doesn't change the height, doesn't move them up and down, doesn't change the amplitude, just rotates them, I mean, just translates them horizontally. So it's very easy to understand. So here are some standard forms um, we could choose. Here are the two that are focused on eigenvectors, here are the two that are focused on reactivity. They're just different rotation, just different translations. Here, if we're going to put an eigenvector on the x-axis, that means we've, wrote, we've translated along so that we have a zero here of the, tr of the tangential velocity at theta equals zero. Here we've put the maximum of the tangential velocity at theta equals zero. Here when we're focusing on reactivity, we've put a zero of the radial velocity at theta equals zero. And here we've put the maximum of the radial velocity at theta equals zero. So it's just how much we choose to translate along the theorem part of it is look at these beautiful matrices. When we translate, here, what's these? These are the eigenvalues down the diagonal and um, two times the midline of the, of the tangential velocity. Here's the tangential velocity. So two times the midline is just the difference between the off diagonals of the original matrix. Alternatively, in this one, these are the ortho values, which are the eigenvectors of some rotated matrix, but they're the ortho values of the system, and this is the trace of the original matrix. One of these guys, remember, row one was the actual reactivity. Here's just a reminder. Row one and row two are the maximum and minimum of the red curve, of the radial component, and tau one and tau two are the maximum and minimum of the tangential component. So back in here, these are also easy to calculate. Tau 1 and tau 2 and those midlines, row 1 and row 2 and the midlines. So these different rotations, these different conjugated rotations of the system are very, very easy to calculate. And that's, it, well, maybe that's useful. Um, so going back to the paper by um, Mike and Hal, one of the things they did in this, in this paper was they defined the idea of um, maximum amplification, which is how much, how much can a trajectory grow away from the origin before it turns back? What's the maximum amplification over time you can have? And so they have this, um, this figure is from their paper and it's, like, it's the amplification window and it's, um, it's an example, here's one system, a one, well, let's do the lower one, this is one system where you start at the init initial condition and the system just, um, that initial condition goes directly to the origin. Whereas here's one that is reactive, so you start at the initial condition and it grows and grows and grows, that's how much it grows before it heads back towards the origin. So the examples they are using are examples that fit our intuition very well. Here was, um, the same eigenvalues, in both cases, the same eigenvalues, an attractor with different values on the off diagonals. And those different values are what, are the high value here is what's bringing the eigenvectors together and giving us the reactivity. So this was the reactive system, and it's in this format um, of putting the eigenvalues, rotating the eigenvalues to the x-axis. 
So it's a beautiful format. We have a lot of intuition for it, but it actually makes it a little challenging to capture the reactivity. Another beautiful paper, um, more recent, by Peter Harrington, Mark Lewis, and Pauline van den Driesch. They're studying the transient growth of um, population that dies off in the long run, but they show that it can grow arbitrarily large before it dies off. So that's a very interesting result. And the form of their example is like this. It centers the eigenvectors. So again, it's focused on eigenvectors and centers them, and this is a classic standard form for centered eigenvectors. And again, it makes the reactivity a little challenging to capture. So here's a question for you. If out of these standard forms, which would you use to try and capture maximum amplification? So here are the two eigenvector-based ones. Here are the two reactivity-based ones. I think this one's good. So if we take this one, so we'll start with an example, um, and we want to know the maximum amplification. So we know the reactive region. We can work out the reactive region. It's easy to find this angle delta from the um, entries of the matrix. So we know how big that reactive region is. So here's one algorithm for finding the maximum amplification. Start at initial condition 1, 0. Numerically, so it's numerical, but numerically integrate until you reach angle delta and calculate how far you are. What's your radial length when you've reached angle delta? So it's a very clean algorithm for finding your maximum amplification. It also gives us a bound on the maximum amplification. So this picture inspires, OK, well, why not just go straight up? Let's just go straight up from 1. Wherever we hit delta is an upper bound for the maximum amplification we can have. So that's kind of useful. And that upper bound is um, just the amplitude over the midline of those sinusoidal functions. So it's this divided by that. So that's one useful um, way to use those standard forms. Another way, coming back, let's come back to our original question of, um, remember we were thinking about the variational equation and we have our neighbors and our, as, as we move down our trajectory and we're thinking about do our neighbors get closer to us or not and there are situations in which you can rotate the frame and keep the trajectories trapped in the reactive region. So this, this is another beautiful paper by Kresimir Jozik and Robert Rosenbaum. And they were, this is in Siam Review, and they explain really nicely that whole idea of, of rotating, rotating a reactive system to, to find a system which does this. If, this trajectory is, a, is kind of the punchline, even though all the way, for every frozen moment in time, the system is, it's a, it's a non-autonomous linear system, so it's changing in time, but for every frozen moment in time, you have an attractor. Even so, this is the trajectory that, that results. So it's attracting for a while, and then it's moving away, and then moving away, and then it just spirals away arbitrarily far which might remind you of a saddle. I mean, it's a, it's a rotating saddle, but what happens with a saddle equilibrium? You start with an initial condition, you come close to the equilibrium, and then you get pushed away. So that's what's happening here as you rotate. So let's look at that from the point of view of these radial and tangential velocities. Here's an example of an attractor. Why is that an attractor? Here are the zeros. Zeros of the tangential velocity are the eigenvectors. And the radial component of velocity at those eigenvectors is negative. So you know that's an attractor. You also know it has a big reactive region. So even though we haven't drawn the dynamics here, you know what it looks like. It looks like all those examples of, of an attractor that, where you move away from the origin before you come in. An attractor that's almost um, a spiral. 
Now, we said before that rotating the frame, we know that rotating the frame is, like, is adding angular velocity. So if we add angular velocity, we know that's equivalent to shifting the tangential velocity up. So let's go ahead and shift this tangential velocity up. So taking this same tangential velocity curve and shifted it up, and now look where the, attract, where the um, eigenvectors are. There's an eigenvector here, an eigenvector here. This eigenvector has a positive eigenvalue. This eigenvector has a negative eigenvalue. But by shifting the tangential velocity up, we've created um, an eigenvector with a positive eigenvalue. So we've turned this equilibrium in the rotating frame. This equilibrium is now a saddle. So that equilibrium has exactly this behavior of, in the rotating frame, trajectories come in towards the equilibrium and then escape. And that's exactly what we're seeing in that trajectory. So this approach also allows us to know, okay, how much? How much do you need to translate? How much do you need to translate the um, tangential velocity up or down to create this unstable eigenvector? Um, there's, there are bounds. And how much do you have to move it up or down to get the maximum um, instability in your nonlinear system, in your non-autonomous system, rotating system? So it gives us a lot of, it just gives us a bit more control than we've had before on how to harness the reactivity and use it. So I think that's um, it's a good place to stop. I should mention, I forgot to mention at the beginning, this is joint work, all of this is joint work with James Broder and Alana Haslam Hyde, who is currently a, a graduate student at Boston University, but this work grew out of her undergraduate honors thesis. So thank you guys. We definitely thank you so much again. Pleasure. Thank your speaker again. Um, thank you, guys. Uh, and uh, we definitely have time for some questions. I do request that you use one of the microphones. There's one on this side and one on that side. So any questions for our speaker? Thank you very much. Is this on? Yes. Is it Thank on? you, Mary Lou. You talked about planar systems. Can you say something? Hi, that's else? Mike, right? Yeah. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shy. This uh, is Mike of Mike Neubert. <laughs> Go ahead. You, it, that was very pretty. Thank you. Uh, I'm doing this because the, I want to see you. You talked about planar systems. Can you say something about um, how the work you've done might extend to higher dimensions? Oh, good question, yes. How, how would it extend to higher dimensions? So that's, that's really an interesting question. We've thought about it a bit in three dimensions. So if you want to separate the radial velocity from all the other velocities, all the tangential velocities, now tangential means around a sphere. And so um, you we really have to think, what we're really thinking about is the curl around that, on that sphere. So it becomes harder to work with. So it's something we're really enjoying looking at, but I don't have much to say about it yet. So up the dimensions, it's going to get less and less tractable. Um, but it is the, it's, you know, one radial velocity and then your n minus one dimensional sphere and what's happening on that. Yes. Hi, Meredith. Hi, that was a fantastic talk, and the Thank you. math is beautiful and wonderful. And at, near the beginning, you had papers that looked like sort of talking about resilience and seems ecology-based, yeah. maybe. And I'm wondering if you can now tie it back to us about the ways that everything you showed us might be useful in thinking about resilience or other ecological questions. Yes, absolutely. So um, I, I didn't include the slide, but of course what it does is it gives us, so that's another direction that we're working on right now, but it gives us a new tool to say, can we, can we find new conditions 
under which, for example, one type, one question, immediate question, can we find new conditions under which if we do have frozen time attraction all the way, then we know we have an, a, a stable attracting flow kick equilibrium, which is going to tell us something about the stability of the ecosystem that's being disturbed, right? That's our ultimate question. What's the stability of the ecosystem being disturbed? And so track back, track back, track back. Can we find conditions under which we can determine that stability? And will this, will this viewpoint and this harnessing of reactivity help us find those conditions? And um, it reminds me of um, a quote um, a friend once described to me the work of Smail versus the work of Hirsch. So what, what we showed, one of the things we mentioned here is that if you do have frozen time attraction along the way, do you always have, a, do you have cumulative attraction? No. So that's a kind of smell type result, a, a smell type result of, can you control this thing? No, anything can happen. Give up. I'm not claiming smell says give up, but it's sort of a bit disturbing. It's like, oh, should we, maybe we should give up. And the Hirsch type of approach is, okay, anything can happen. Right, let's find conditions under which the good stuff happens. And so that's where we are now. Okay, we're looking for conditions under which we can control what happens. <laughs>